Okay, so in today's lecture, I'll uh, say a bit more about quantum scars. Uh, in fact, a completely different mechanism to what we were talking yesterday. And I would like to point this out uh, because uh, uh, sort of the, okay, the interesting things about this mechanism are simple to state, but this mechanism has been discovered only recently. So it might be useful to just say it because some people might get interested and think a bit more about it, right? So that's one motivation. There are several interesting questions here. And then after I'm done with the quantum scars uh, today, uh, then in the rest of the lecture, I'll uh, present some general generalities about the fluke or periodically driven uh, systems. And in particular, I'll give some very rapid uh, introduction to some concepts of many body localization which I'll need for my next lecture tomorrow, which will be my last lecture, to understand what are known as uh, uh, discrete time crystals. And these discrete time crystals are a phase of matter uh, which you cannot stabilize in equilibrium. Okay, They are forbidden states in equilibrium, but they, you can stabilize them in, uh, in, uh, 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 in uh, these fluke systems or these driven systems. Okay. So that is the plan for the rest of the thing. And we'll see how the how we can manage the time. And if there are is if there's some time left, which is unlikely, then maybe I'll see a couple of more things uh, apart from this. Okay. Yeah. Good. So uh maybe uh, a, a few of you or some of you inter uh, uh, went to Harshkar's uh, tutorial in the night yesterday. But in any case, towards the end of my talk, as I try to motivate to you, in this PXP model, there is this uh, sort of a big spin, big SU2 spin of length uh, uh, capital L by 2 sort of uh, embedded in the subspace. But it's not a perfect embedding in the sense that there are small matrix elements between this L plus 1 cross L plus 1 block okay, and the rest of the thermal block. There are some small matrix elements which cause this tunneling. If you see the blue, uh, sorry, which caused this decay? If you see the blue curve, okay, this curve is the sort of the uh, fidelity, the many body wave function, right? So you just look at the return probability. Uh, you just look at the return probability and you see these revivals here. But you also see that in the PHP model, there's a decay like this, right? That's because of this very small matrix elements which uh, connect uh, these L plus one states. Uh, to the rest of the uh, states, which uh, which satisfy ETH, right? Okay, so that's this plot for the PXP model. So now I also said that there is a way to sort of uh, add some small perturbations in the PXP model, okay? Some small additional terms in the PXP model to improve this uh, SU2 structure or to minimize the error in this SU2 structure, right? Because we want to make it as closed as possible. So basically, you, uh, the addition of one such term shows this graph. And in this graph, you can easily see that uh, now the scars are much more separated from the rest of your spectrum. Okay, And in fact, if you focus here, which is the important plot here, please focus on the green line. Then you can see that at least for these system sizes, for n equal to 24, at least for these system sizes, you see that the revivals are almost perfect, right? Till this time scale, right? So that's pretty nice, okay? Then if you add some further correction, there is only a very slight improvement uh, here, but uh, the stars become even more separated from the rest of the thermal band, okay? So, yeah. And uh, a similar approach to add small perturbations can enhance some other sort of uh, initial state revivals as well. For example, the Z3 state, which is nothing but one zero zero one zero zero one zero zero in our language. Okay, so a state like that and Z four as well, right? Okay, good. But after this, I'll switch gears to something else. Okay, but I want you to notice one thing here. So yesterday, I already told you that the PXP model has an e two minus e symmetry, which is completely evident from your exact diagonalization data because you see that this graph is symmetric about e equal to zero. But I want you to notice one very peculiar thing here. 
okay which is evident in particular in this graph or or even more so in this graph notice that there is an exact degeneracy of e equal to zero states okay so from now on i'll call them zero modes because they are at e equal to zero okay and because the spectrum is symmetric about e equal to zero uh, i mean the number zero has a precise meaning okay so uh, so these there's a, there's a huge degeneracy of these zero modes from the numerics right so i hope you can see that very clearly from my cursor so now it raises a question yesterday i told you that all these things have been done after resolving all the global symmetries so what are the global symmetries here translation as well as this discrete inversion symmetry so these graphs have been done after resolving these global symmetries so then you might ask if i have resolved these global symmetries why do i see this incredible degeneracy in my exact diagonalization right that's a question which you should reasonably ask yourself okay so good uh, so i hope uh, this is a uh, as surprising to you as it was to maybe someone who looked at this graph for the first time okay so yeah uh, good so let's see so this is the question why are there so many zero modes and what protects this massive degeneracy okay so as i already said this model has two global symmetries one is the translation symmetry and the other is the discrete spatial inversion symmetry uh and uh, you can uh, uh, you can easily sort of uh, resolve these symmetries in your exact diagonalization to go to bigger system sizes okay and of course because these are global symmetries the hamiltonian commutes with both these symmetries right if you define the symmetry operators appropriately okay now there is an important point here which is the following so uh the hamiltonian also has this e2 minus e symmetry as i told you the pxp model so basically that is because the hamiltonian also anti commutes with a particular operator and this operator is nothing but the product of all the sigma t's at all the sides okay now you see as you know from the algebra of pauli matrices uh, the pauli matrices anti commute with each other if you take the same site index right so this is very easy to see remember your pxp hamiltonian right so the p term has a z component and then there is a sigma x and then there is again a p i can forget about the p's because this is also z and that is also z right but now suppose i pass the q through my hamiltonian right now you can of course write the pxp term as a sum of many local terms each of these local terms has only one sigma x term right at some particular site now you just pass this q whenever in this string whenever there is a corresponding sigma z at that particular side of course when you pass the q through the hamiltonian it changes sign so it's easy to see that this operator q anti commutes with your hamiltonian right because uh, uh, this just whatever i said implies that h times q uh, plus q times h is zero okay right so that means the following uh, this i leave as an exercise you can easily verify this uh it's a one line proof that means that for each eigen state with energy e suppose i denote that eigen state uh, by this notation okay for each eigen state with energy e there is actually a partner with energy minus e and that partner is given uniquely by this operator acting on this energy state e okay so basically you can imagine this operator is some kind of a chiral operator so for every e there is a partner minus e okay good so now uh, now there is a very interesting uh, theorem uh, which was uh, proven by these two gentlemen in a, a very nice paper and uh, even the nature physics paper by abanin and others which i pointed out they also sort of uh, made uh, very nice statements about uh, uh, the fact that i'm going to tell you later uh, in a different way okay so their interpretation here and the other papers interpretation are of course related but it's two slightly different language so the bottom line is this suppose i have a lattice hamiltonian h okay where uh, i can define operators like this so there is a q which is like the chirality operator okay and there is, uh, this q is important because it gives me my e2 minus e symmetry okay 
So that's why e equal to zero is special. Okay, if your spectrum is not symmetric about e to minus e, there is nothing very special about e equal to zero, right? Uh, the second thing is uh, uh, there is also another symmetry i, which is a, usually a discrete spatial symmetry. So it's some lattice symmetry. It's some kind of a discrete inversion symmetry of your lattice, right? So it's almost like you have a lattice. You sort of put a mirror somewhere, and you just reflect your lattice, right? So it's a discrete spatial inversion symmetry. Uh, so then that discrete spatial inversion inversion symmetry usually commutes uh, with your uh, Hamiltonian, right? Because it's symmetry of the problem. Then if you can show the following, that the combination Q times I anti-commutes with the Hamiltonian. Of course, in this case, just from whatever I've said, that is obviously true. But in general, if you just show this weaker property that H anti-commutes with this combination q times i, then from this index theorem, you can prove the following statement that the degeneracy of these zero modes scales exponentially with system size. Okay. And okay, so the degeneracy of these zero modes scales exponentially with system size. So you count the number of zero modes in your ED. And suppose uh, you are very clever and you can do exact angularization on bigger and bigger and bigger system sizes. So you keep counting the number of these exact zero modes, okay? So if you zoom in in your graph here, you will only see these exact zero modes and nothing around it. Of course, uh, you know, there will be some numbers that something like, okay, one thing is, of course, these are exact zero modes only till machine precision. But if you zoom in here, you will see that these are really zero modes, okay? So, uh, so if you count their number and you keep increasing the system size, you will see a scaling of their number like this. So there is an incredibly large number of these zero modes here, okay? And they're protected by this uh, uh, funny thing. So they are protected because of somehow the intertwining of this uh, anti-commutation and this uh, commutation, okay? So, yeah, um, okay. And these exact zero modes from earlier studies seem to satisfy eigenstate thermalization hypothesis based on uh, finite system sizes, okay? even though there is no level repulsion between them. They are exactly sitting at zero. But nonetheless, it seems that uh, uh, they satisfy ETH as they should because they are mid-spectrum states. They are infinite temperature states. But of course, somebody could have objected and said, oh, no, no, uh, you know, uh, 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 you know that uh, uh, there's no level repulsion amongst them. So how are you so sure? But there are some exact, uh, some exact angularization studies where they have carefully seen ETH there. But you should already object and say something here, which is the following. You see, this car, this car here is also exactly at e equal to zero. This car here is also exactly at e equal to zero. So there is a very interesting possibility. Even though most of these zero modes satisfy volume loss scaling of entanglement and satisfy eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, maybe some particular zero modes do not, and they are quantum scars, okay? So if you think like that, then it's sort of obvious if I tell you this kind of an interpretation just by looking at these graphs, okay? So can I actually think of a mechanism like this? Okay, so that's the point I'm going to highlight now. I hope this is clear, at least the statement that I'm trying to make about these zero modes being, be, there being a huge degeneracy in these zero modes. And basically this uh, theorem assures this degeneracy. If you break any of these conditions, okay, then of course this massive degeneracy is immediately lifted. Okay, so yeah. Uh, maybe I'll take a pause. Are there any questions at this point? Okay, so if there are no questions at this point, let me go on. So here is an alternate mechanism of uh, uh, scarring. Okay, so here is an alternate mechanism of scarring. Uh, so, so by the way, uh, Obishikta, can we confirm? Uh, I can see somehow sort of a line from uh, Zoom on my screen, but I hope it's not visible on the. Uh, uh, no, yeah, it looks fine. Okay, okay, good. Yeah. So, so here is an alternate mechanism of scarring. So you see, imagine there is a Hamiltonian. Now I'm giving you a recipe. So uh, see, for the 
uh, yesterday I told you that uh, one recipe of generating quantum stars is you start with some very simple problem and you break some symmetry in a highly non-generic way. Okay, right. But here is a completely different recipe. Okay, the recipe is you start with a problem. That problem may be highly interacting. Okay, typically I want it to be highly interacting. Okay, so you start with a highly interacting problem which satisfies this condition. Okay, now this highly interacting problem because it satisfies this uh, condition. Uh, so maybe I then add an extra coupling to this problem to break this condition. Okay, but let's say at the coupling value lambda equal to zero, uh, I have this sort of uh, emergent uh, index theorem which gives me exact zero modes at e equal to zero. Okay, so then. Uh, there exists some unitary transformation. That unitary transformation may be very complicated, but there exists some unitary transformation through which you can take your Hamiltonian and you can block diagonalize your Hamiltonian into the space of zero modes and the space of non-zero modes at lambda equal to zero, where this index theorem is true. Okay. Then from this theorem, you know that the number of uh, states here or the size of this block is exponentially scaling in system size, just like the size of this block, but typically this block is uh, much bigger than this block. Okay, right. Now, suppose uh, you... No, sir. Yeah, yeah. So can you again uh, state this, uh, the condition for this exponential is in the... Uh... Yes, yes, I'll state that condition again. So there are multiple ways of stating it. Let me just state the most simple version. So the most simple version is you take a model uh, which has a, a sum operator. I call it a chirality operator. That operator should anti-commute with the Hamiltonian. Okay. This condition ensures that the spectrum is symmetric around e equal to zero and every state at e has a partner at minus e. That's one condition. The second condition is that the model should have some kind of a discrete spatial inversion symmetry. Okay. So that operator is a discrete operator. It's some discrete spatial inversion symmetry. So this is some lattice symmetry, whereas this is some internal symmetry. This internal symmetry is sort of, I should even call it a symmetry. This internal thing anti-commutes with the Hamiltonian, whereas this lattice symmetry commutes with the Hamiltonian. These are the two conditions I got, okay? And then okay. you can construct any model you want, any interacting model you want. Okay, so I was just thinking like, uh, supposing uh, models like, uh, uh, let's say the frustrated models which have exponential number of ground states, mm -hmm. they don't uh, they don't fall uh, in. Abhishek, this. The, you asked a very good question. The rest of the first half an hour will be on them. So, in fact, I'll convince, try to convince you that this mechanism is almost like an order by disorder mechanism in uh, in uh, Hilbert space. Okay, but uh, related to your question. Uh, the, the the models you are thinking about these frustrated models those are classical models okay that's why oh, like uh, oh right okay, okay okay you see okay. see normally in quantum mechanics see of course you're right i mean uh, for example the spin ice model right the well known right. classical spin ice model uh, that has an exponential degeneracy of ground states for example right okay uh, because of geometric frustration but the moment you introduce quantum mechanics there, ah, right, okay. that degeneracy is lifted. But this degeneracy is not lifted by quantum mechanics. Oh, okay. Okay, 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 okay. That's the important thing. So I'm actually talking about quantum models, highly interacting okay. quantum models. Okay. Okay. That's the important thing. So these are exact zero modes which have an exponential degeneracy. I would like to stress another thing. Of course, zero modes are well known in physics. Okay. But usually we talk of zero modes which are sort of in the ground state or low energy. But these are mid-spectrum zero modes. These are mid-spectrum zero modes. Okay? Mm -hmm. okay. Uh, yeah. Good. So now the picture is, as I already said, there is some complicated unitary transformation, uh, which might be very hard to find. But nonetheless, there is some unitary transformation which exists, which basically block diagonalizes your Hamiltonian into these two separate paths. And both these paths are actually scaling exponentially with system size. Both these things. Okay? Uh, it's just that this number uh, is uh, bigger than this number. That's all. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, good. Uh, then suppose you turn on a lambda which is not equal to zero. So lambda is some extra coupling which I introduce in my theory. And I, as I already told you, 
this uh, whenever uh, whenever this coupling is non zero this other coupling is non zero then this index theorem conditions are violated so obviously you would then think that there is no way that this subspace and this subspace can stay on their own and typically everything will hybridize with each other of course you will be true in general but what i'm going to show you is that there are some highly peculiar things which can happen in well known models uh, which actually results in again a different uh, kind of anomalous quantum star so what is this highly peculiar thing so the highly peculiar thing is there are some particular directions in this zero mode subspace i indicate them by red arrows here so these directions are of course some precise eigen vectors obviously right so there are some particular directions here so when you turn on certain couplings so i'm now giving you a recipe of generating quantum stars so i'm saying that you take these highly interacting theories and you turn on certain specific extra interactions okay then what may happen is that all the other zero modes hybridize with the non zero mode and then this thing basically gives you eth okay uh, by the way i would like to comment here about one thing this thing gives eth and this thing gives eth at lambda equal to 0 okay so only these special directions violate eth and what might happen is what might happen is that these special directions are sort of st stabilized by this extra term that you have added in your theory so lambda times some let's say lambda times some h lambda okay so normally you won't notice it here why won't you notice it here because there's an exponential number of states here uh, the theory doesn't realize that you know you need to sort of sit in these directions there's no quote and quote pinning potential here but now you turn on this extra interaction and then all the other sort of zero modes hybridize here but these guys they survive okay they survive and they emerge as quantum many body stars okay so these special eigen vectors are some very precise linear combinations of these exponentially large number of uh, zero modes and these special linear combinations survive as eigen vectors of this problem okay so the kind of problem i'm thinking of is the following so here is my coupling lambda so this uh, so i just split my interacting hamiltonian into two interacting pieces so o kinetic okay which uh, basically satisfies this index theorem plus uh, lambda times o potential i call this kinetic and potential for some historical reasons because i want to show this mechanism in some well known models okay which people didn't realize before okay so uh, so 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 uh, the point is that uh, uh, if you take uh, lambda equal to 0 then this happens whereas if you take lambda not equal to 0 then of course your spectrum is not symmetric about equal to 0 because uh, uh, this condition is lost this condition is lost but what happens is that there are some particular linear combinations of the zero modes which are actually simultaneous eigen kets of o kinetic and o potential that is the non trivial state of course uh, these directions being uh, eigen ket of o kinetic is a trivial statement because all these uh, states here are eigen kets of o kinetic with eigen value zero in fact okay because these are zero modes uh, so any linear combination of them would also be an eigen ket of o kinetic because they have exactly the same eigen value all of them right but the more non trivial statement is that these directions are also eigen kits of o potential see normally in a many body system if if i give you an exact eigen state that exact eigen state is not the eigen state of the two non commuting pieces in your hamiltonian so these two things are non commuting uh, terms in your hamiltonian okay so this already tells you that there's something special happening okay so yeah so basically Now, uh, just the simple argument tells you that if such a thing happens, I haven't yet told you that such a thing is bound to happen. But let's say if such a thing happens, then these uh, red arrows are definitely anomalous states in your Hilbert space. Why do I say that? Let me give you a very simple argument. So both these theories uh, are interacting theories. So the full theory is also an interacting theory. The full theory at any lambda is an interacting theory. Okay. uh any finite lambda is an interacting theory uh, quantum theory 
So suppose you change your coupling slightly from lambda one to lambda two. I already told you that if you change your coupling slightly from lambda one to lambda two, then a high energy eigenstate here looks completely different from a high energy eigenstate here. Okay, and that's basically the basis of the random ma matrix theory success to look at the uh, high energy part of the spectrum. Okay, right? Good. However, if you look at these special states, these special states, if you look at these special states, then you see these special states are eigenvectors at lambda one. These special states are also eigenvectors at lambda, lambda two. The only thing which changes is their eigenvalue because these special states are simultaneous eigenvectors of both the O kinetic and O potential. So changing lambda doesn't change these eigenvectors. They only change their eigenvalues. Okay. So these blue lines are unchanged. Okay, these blue lines are unchanged. That already tells you that these states must violate eigenstate thermalization hypothesis because they are unchanged when you change this coupling. Okay, and that cannot happen for a typical high energy eigenstate because a typical high energy eigenstate changes completely when you change the coupling by any amount. Okay, so that already tells you that these are anomalous uh, states. Okay, and these anomalous states are in fact localized in Hilbert space. Uh, whereas these individual zero modes are not localized in Hilbert space. So this is a very funny sort of an order by disorder mechanism in uh, Hilbert space. Okay, so, so this order by disorder mechanism is something well known in classical frustrated magnets, also in sort of quantum versions. So uh, just to give an example, so I mean, again, suppose you take uh, one of these uh, well known problems in uh, classical magnetism, like a spin ice problem. Uh, so there, I won't expand on this, there, uh, uh, due to geometric frustration, there's an exponential degeneracy of the ground state manifold. Now, when you turn quantum mechanics, that degeneracy is lost, okay, and you stabilize some orders, okay. Here, the picture is that, again, this degeneracy is lost here, and you stabilize some anomalous states. That's the picture here. That's why I'm calling it uh, sort of like a order by disorder, but in the Hilbert space, okay. Right, so now let me give you a very concrete model. I won't go into the details of this. Let me, but if you're interested in the details, you can look at this paper, okay? Uh, uh, so basically this is a very well-known model. So I was talking about the spin ice because this is just the two dimensional version of that problem. That spin ice problem is a very famous problem in uh, uh, classical as well as quantum magnetism. Uh, this is just a two dimensional version of this. So, uh, so because uh, there is some frustration there, uh, so I can imagine the problem like this. So you see, I'm drawing the problem on a strip. Okay, I'm drawing the problem on a strip. So there are these things, there are these arrows, which can only be up or down. So you can again, imagine them as spin half degrees of freedom. And so if the arrow goes out, you can call it SZ equal to plus one. If the arrow goes in, you can call it SZ equal to minus one. Okay, something like that. And you can choose some sub lattice uh, notation here also, because what goes out for one sub lattice, of course, goes in for the other sub lattice. So you have to do all that. So now, exactly like spin ice in uh, frustrated magnetism, this problem also satisfies the two in two out rule. This is a very famous uh, thing in magnetism. Okay. So you see, I go to any point here. If there are two arrows which are going out, like this arrow is going out and this arrow is going out, then two arrows are also coming in. This arrow is coming in, this arrow is coming in, right? So uh, that's it. Okay, so this is the sort of uh, Hilbert space of your theory. This is again a constrained Hilbert space. Why is it a constrained Hilbert space? Because I cannot take an arrow here and just flip it. So suppose I take this arrow, right? Suppose I take this arrow and I just flip it to this incoming. Then it violates this two in two out rule. So this is again a constraint Hilbert space. Now uh, I write a Hamiltonian here, which is a very simple Hamiltonian. And again, it's a very well-known Hamiltonian from uh, quantum magnetism and also in uh, lattice uh, gauge theory. I don't have the time to expand on that. This problem is well-known to both these communities, okay, from a long, long time. So, uh, so this Hamiltonian in condensed matter, this is called the rockshar kibelson Hamiltonian. Okay, Rockshar Kibelson Hamilton. So, uh, uh, <clears throat> so basically, uh, there is a potential term. So, the potential term just means that that term is diagonal in this SZ basis, and there's a kinetic term, which just means that that term is off diagonal. 
in this uh, SZ basis. Okay. So what is the potential term? The potential term tells you that you go to each plaquette. Okay. And you look at plaquettes which are either clockwise flippable like this. Sorry, this is not clockwise. This is anti-clockwise. Or uh, so either anti-clockwise flippable or clockwise flippable. If you find a plaquette like this, you just uh, count that number as one. You increment your O potential by one. If your plaquette is not flippable, you just associate zero. So O potential is just a counting operator, which just tells you how many flippable plaquettes are there in your uh, in one particular realization, like this. Okay. What is O kinetic? O kinetic gives you the quantum dynamics. So O kinetic is again like the minimal operator you put, which gives you quantum dynamics, but does not take you out of your constraint Hilbert space. So what is O kinetic? O kinetic is simply this. If you have a plaquette which is uh, which has the circulation as counterclockwise, you just change it to clockwise like this, and vice versa. Okay, you can easily convince yourself that that uh, respects the constraints of the Hilbert space, which is two and two out. Anything else, O kinetic just annihilates it. That's your full quantum Hamiltonian. Okay, that's it. That's the full quantum Hamiltonian, and this is a very well known problem in uh, condensed matter, especially in the spill liquid and uh, dimer model community. Okay, this is called the Rockshark Wilson Hamilton. Okay, uh, I won't expand on this, but this is also a U1 lattice gauge theory. This is an exact lattice gauge theory which has a U1 uh, uh, local uh, symmetry. Okay, and uh, these uh, lines then are like electric fluxes. And uh, uh, this operator, this O kinetic operator, is like a magnetic field uh, operator. This generates a magnetic flux. So this is actually also well known in uh, lattice gauge theory. Okay, so uh, so I'll just show you some quick results about this model. But I mean, if there are any questions, quick questions, I can take them now. Otherwise, I'll go on. So this is the model, and this model at lambda equal to zero. I'll just say one more thing. This model at lambda equal to zero has that has that index theorem. Okay, so you can define again an operator Q at lambda equal to zero, which anti commutes with the O kinetic, and at lambda equal to zero as well as at lambda not equal to zero, you can easily show that this problem has spatial inversion symmetry. I have just uh, denoted the reflection planes here. Okay, so when you go to lambda not equal to zero, the spatial inversion symmetry stays intact, but this operator Q no longer anti-commutes with the Hamiltonian when lambda is not equal to zero. Okay, so this index theorem breaks down at any non-zero lambda. Okay, so you see, therefore, I'm already given you a problem where I can sort of realize uh, this thing. Okay, so any questions up, up, up till this point? Okay, if not, then I go on. Uh, so now I'll just show you some numerical plots to tell you that uh, exactly such a thing happens. Okay. So on, on for yeah. lambda equal to zero, uh, it's uh, e easy to diagonalize this, is it? No, 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 no. It's not easy it's to diagonalize this oh. because at lambda equal to zero, this is a highly interacting theory. You see, uh, at lambda equal to zero, only the O kinetic is there. O right, kinetic yeah. is like a quantum thing. It's a highly interacting theory. Okay, but it looks like a simple. It's, you just flip the. No, no. Of course, it looks simple, but, but it's even, it can be. Hammer, di no, is no, there no, an it, exact? It's not. No, there's no exact solution. There's no. Oh, exact okay, 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 okay. No, there's no exact solution. Right, okay. Okay. So but it's known that the ground state is uh, has exponential because of the theorem. Because of the theorem, exactly. Right. But Obishek, that if you tell me, can I write the eigen vectors of the zero modes? I don't have an oh. answer. To Oh, okay, okay. okay. So only the theorem tells me that there is an exponentially large number of zero modes. If you ask okay. me what is the nature of the zero modes, that's an open problem. Okay. Okay. That's not known. Okay. Right, okay. Good. Okay. Good. So now I just give you some data. So I just go to the computer and I uh, diagonalize this problem at a finite lambda. Okay. Let's say lambda is some order one number. Of course, if I'm at lambda equal to close to zero, this effect would be hard to see on a, a small system size. In an infinite lattice, you will still see that effect if it survives. But uh, because I'm doing exact diagonalization on a small system size, I take lambda to be order one. Okay. So then I do this problem on some ladders. Okay. 
So two cross L ladders and four cross L ladders, something like that. So because of the constraint in my Hilbert space, I can still go to very large systems. In fact, I can go till system sizes as large as 64 spins. Okay. But I can do that because my Hilbert space has a constraint. So of course my Hilbert space is exploding exponentially fast, but it's not exploding as two raised to the power L or something. It's, it's, it's sort of weaker than that. Okay, good. So here's some exact diagonalization data. So you see, uh, so maybe you look at this plot. So at some particular coupling lambda equal to one. Okay, so this is again uh, well motivated because uh, this coupling is the so-called Rockshar Kivelson point. Again, this is a very well known point for quantum for people who study quantum magnetism and for people who study dimer models. Okay. So all I'm trying to tell you is that these are models which have been studied to, to death. Okay. So, but there is this interesting new angle here. Okay. So, so I take this coupling particularly to this number. I could have taken it to some other number as well. Here I take some other number. Okay. But this is the Raksha Kivelson point. So at the Raksha Kivelson point, you can see that uh, if I take different system sizes, you can see that the, the high energy states sort of satisfy volume law, right? And of course, you can see that there's no E2 minus E symmetry there. Because as I told you, at any finite lambda, Q does not anti-commute with your Hamiltonian. So there is no E2 minus E symmetry. Okay. But you see that there are these states. In particular, look at the red curve. So most of the states are here for size 12. So size 12 has 12 into 2 into 2 spins. Okay. So yeah. So it has 48 spins. So so this guy, uh, most of the things have uh, uh, volume law entanglement here, right? But these guys have a much smaller entanglement. There are some few states which have a much smaller entanglement. So they are quantum scars by my definition. And by the way, I have resolved in the global quantum numbers here. Okay. So it's all in one symmetry sector. And yeah, so these are quantum scars. So basically, if you stare at your ED, there are four quantum many body scars for this particular example. For some other example, there are other number of scars. I won't go into that. I just choose a simple example. For this particular geometry, there are four quantum many body scars with simultaneously diagonalized O potential and O kinetic. Of course, the eigenvalue for O kinetic is zero, obviously, because as I told you, these are linear combinations of my zero mode at lambda equal to zero. So the eigenvalue of O kinetic for these guys is zero. But what is more important for me is that they also diagonalize, these four states also diagonalize O potential and their eigenvalue is the number of uh, plaquettes in my system divided by T with some precise integer. Therefore, the eigenvalue of the full Hamiltonian is just lambda times NP by 2 plus Z. That's it. So this is exactly the eigenvalue I get here if I look at the energy. Okay, that's it. So now, uh, let me convince you that these states arise from zero modes. Okay, let me convince you. So here is the uh, proof of that. So this is full exact diagonalization data. Okay, now suppose I try to just go into my zero mode subspace. I just try to go into my zero mode subspace and I project this full Hamiltonian into my zero mode subspace and I try to find these uh, new states. Okay, so the data I showed you is for the full problem. Now I do an extra projection where I just sit there. So I'm doing some extra thing and I just try to find these states. Okay. Now, if I do that, then of course, uh, if I find some non-trivial states, they are guaranteed to be linear combinations of only the zero modes because I've projected in that space only. And indeed, you see that. So I here I sort of uh, plot the amplitude of the state in some particular basis. So already you can see that uh, these high energy states are anomalous because if I take a neighboring state, you will get sort of weights everywhere here. Okay, because uh, a high energy state uh, should have a weight everywhere in a sort of a local basis. Okay, uh, but these have weights only at very few places. So this graph I obtained from the full ED. This is the, for the wave function. I'm trying to sort of denote the wave function pictorially. And this graph I obtained from projecting projecting in the zero mode subspace. You see there, they are identical wave functions. So I have hopefully shown you that this is the mechanism, right? This is the mechanism. So yeah. However, now you can ask, why are they so hard to see if my theory is at lambda equal to zero? 
I told you that this uh, other term is like a pinning potential. Okay, I told you that this other term is like a pinning potential. Uh, so why are these states so hard to see if you don't put this pinning potential? Now, the simple answer to that is, suppose you try to write these directions or these vectors in terms of uh, whatever zero mode subspace you take. The zero mode subspace is some NS cross NS dimensional space. You can choose any orthogonal sort of uh, thing there. Right, of course, you should not choose something after this knowledge. You should not choose a sort of a vector space where one of the directions is like that, because this is only after I give you the ED result. Let's say you just choose some arbitrary basis, okay, any basis you want. Then in that basis, this state, uh, this special state looks like a pseudo random superposition of these uh, zero modes, okay. Uh, I've just drawn the amplitude of the scar state in the zero mode subspace. This looks like a pseudo random uh, superposition of zero modes. And there is no way your system could have sort of realized this if lambda would have been zero. Okay, you would have needed some highly special operators to probe these states. But when your lambda is non zero, automatically this other term, lambda times O potential, provides a pinning potential and therefore you see these states. Okay, so that's the physics of these states. And uh, sorry, so maybe I won't expand on that further. And let me pause here and ask you if there are any questions on this mechanism. And uh, then I'll go over to fluke physics, okay, for the rest of my lecture. So, yeah. So, this is what I wanted to motivate to you. And uh, sort of this gives you a, another way to generate uh, anomalous cars, okay. Uh, the way is you start with uh, highly interacting theories and you just add an extra perturbation which breaks this index theorem. Okay, and then you see what happens. And uh, I have just given you an example, which is an extremely well known example where this thing happens. And this example was studied uh, in both the condensed matter community in frustrated magnetism as well as in lattice stage theory for many, many years. I mean, these two are classic papers in the field. You can see how old they are, and they are still older papers. I haven't just cited them. So, yeah. Okay. So, so this is one other mechanism to start with a highly interacting theory and perturb it to generate uh, anomalous cows. Okay. So, yeah. Let me take a pause here and see if there are any questions. Anup, uh, can you show that plot again in the, in the next page? This one? No, next page. This one. Uh, next. Oh yeah, this one. Yeah. Uh, so the uh, on the left, uh, uh, what is the difference? Oh, one is zero and minus one. No, no. And so so I lambda... uh, Obishek, that this thing is from the full ED. Okay. Right. Yeah. This thing is from the full ED. I just uh, extract yeah. that state from the full ED here. Yeah. Okay? I just extract. And, the, the, and the then you take a projection on the yeah, ground the state manifold. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Uh, for on, on the ground easy. state manifold on the zero manifold. The zero manifold. Right, zero manifold, right. Yeah. Okay. The zero mode manifold. I'm okay. taking a projection and then I'm just diagonalizing th uh, the thing and doing some other stuff. And I can show that the same state appears. Ah, right, so the okay. state, this is just to show any skeptic that the state is just a linear combination of zero modes and nothing else. Okay. So only those peaks, uh, those states contribute to the scars. Those linear combination of those states. Ah uh, no, so, uh, so 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 no. So here the x-axis is some uh, other basis. It's some uh, physical basis. Uh, it's some okay. uh, if oh, you okay, want, okay. it's just the SZ basis, your computational basis. Oh, okay. Okay, 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 okay. But this is the scar base. Uh, this is the zero mode basis. This is the zero okay. mode. Basis. So see that is uh, see this is easy to understand why this graph is pseudo random. This is easy to understand. You see, this space is exponentially large. This space okay. is exponentially large. I'm picking some very particular directions here. Every other direction here is uh, ETH, if you wish. Okay. There are only some very special directions which are non-ETH. Okay. I mean, this statement is not obvious at the start, but if I took this direction for you, this direction, this is an, another vector, right? Obviously, uh, this vector is actually ETH. It would satisfy eigenstate thermalization hypothesis, but this vector would not. Okay, so obviously, if I expand this vector in this basis, it'll look pseudo random because, uh, yeah, so I don't know okay, if yeah, that yeah. was clear, but sorry, so uh, yeah, okay, 
but maybe we can discuss that later as well. I mean, but uh, yeah, so maybe, yeah, but at least I hope this mechanism is clear. I mean, that's what I demonstrated that. Uh, so maybe I'll highlight this point again. If I take an arbitrary vector here, so an arbitrary vector here is, of course, in some particular uh, state in my theory. If I take that state, that state looks like a random vector for local observables. But if I take these particular linear combinations, they are not random vectors anymore. They are some highly, uh, highly anomalous uh, vectors. They have much lower uh, entanglement entropy than volume law. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Anyway, so, yeah. So, anyway, the point I'm trying to make is that there are lots of open issues still left in uh, all these things where our goddesses is violated weekly. So, yeah. And if you remember in lecture three, uh, in my beginning slide, I showed you a dynamics graph and there were three initial conditions there. One was init, init one, init two, and init three. And two of them were going to the same thermal value, and the third one was not going to the same thermal value. It was going something. It was going somewhere completely different. That calculation was for exactly this model. So this model would also show weak ergodicity violations starting from simple initial states. Okay, good. So good. So let me go on to something else, which is the second part of this uh, course, which is uh, uh, fluke phases of interacting matter. If there are no other questions from whatever we have covered till now, maybe I'll take a pause for a couple of minutes to ask if there are any questions from whatever we have covered till now. Okay, so uh, uh, if, that, if that is not the case, uh, uh, let me go on to something different. Of course, I already introduced uh, to you the Fluke uh, protocol or the periodically driven protocol when I was talking of the one dimensional s equal to half transverse field Ising model and there i showed to you in yesterday's lecture beginning of yesterday's lecture that basically uh, your generalized gibbs concept moves over to periodic generalized gibbs concept uh, periodic generalized gibbs ensemble okay in that particular problem okay but this is not so for uh, general interacting theory this is not the case for generally interacting theory so so just to reintroduce some concepts uh, so again, I consider a driving protocol where maybe there is some coupling in my theory and that coupling, that particular coupling, maybe it's a magnetic field, maybe it's some two spin coupling, something, usually it's a magnetic field. Uh, so that coupling I vary as a function of time, but not as any arbitrary function of time, periodically in time. Okay. And that's why it's called fluke physics because, uh, Fluke was the gentleman who started studying these problems uh, for the first time. Of course, uh, he studied this in time. We know from even basic uh, solid state physics of the versions in space, those are crystals, right? So crystals break the full continuous symmetry of space, but they just have, they still have this discrete symmetry, right? Crystals, right? So this is just like the time version of that. Right. And in my talk, uh, for the rest of my lectures, omega d would be the driving frequency, which is related to the time period like this. Okay. Good. So again, I would like you to focus on stroboscopic dynamics at times t equal to n times capital T, where n is an integer. Okay. So now this is already interesting. There is a version of ETH here as well. So what is the version of ETH here? So suppose I take a many body interacting theory. If I take a many body interacting theory, obviously you know that that theory has many, many, many time scales or frequency scales inside it, right? Because uh, suppose you just take a many body theory and you diagonalize your Hamiltonian, you look at your eigenvalues, uh, the eigenvalues comes in all sorts of numbers, rational numbers, irrational numbers. So there are all kinds of energy spacings in your problem, right? All kinds of incommensurate frequencies in your problem. Now you take that kind of a problem and you're driving that problem at this frequency omega d. Then if you look at local correlation functions or local operators again, and you just do unitary dynamics, okay, you just do unitary dynamics like this, then <coughs> what you can show is that if you wait a reasonably long amount of time, so if this n is reasonably large, 
okay it doesn't need to be very large reasonably large then what you can show is that your uh, local uh, operators synchronize with the driving frequency this is already a non trivial statement and this happens for many body problems this does not necessarily happen for few body problems for example it does not happen for a harmonic oscillator if you drive it right so but it happens for a many body problem okay then if you focus on these times uh, there is another version of uh, eigen state thermalization hypothesis uh, which is called the uh, uh, fluke eth uh, where the central objects are the following we already introduced these objects when we were studying the periodic generalized gibbs ensemble for the integrable models uh, but let's introduce them again uh, so remember i said that the central object there was uh, the generate uh, was the single period time evolution operator so suppose i give you some quantum state and i ask you to for this problem evolve it in time for a time of capital t there of course exists a unitary operator which does that and the form of the unitary operator is this where of course i have this time ordering here i have this time ordering here because the hamiltonian is a function of time now and the hamiltonian at time t1 may not commute with the hamiltonian at time t2 so i need this uh, time ordering here okay but then because this is a unitary operator i can always express it by definition as this where this hf is a <coughs> hermitian operator and this hf is a generator is the generator of this uh, u of t okay so i can always think of it like that then if i study the stroboscopic dynamics at time t 2t 3t 4t then it's almost like i'm just doing uh, my normal dynamics with my operator hf right with my uh, fluke hamiltonian hf that's why this object is called fluke hamiltonian okay so however here comes the crucial point the time ordering here makes it notoriously difficult to calculate hf analytically for interacting theories even if uh, these things are very simple looking functions okay because of this time ordering it's notoriously difficult to uh, calculate this hf okay uh, uh, the fluke hamiltonian and uh, there are various theoretical approximations uh, uh, there are things called fluke magnus expansion rotating wave approach uh, fluke perturbation theory adiabatic uh, approach there are lots of things okay so for a reasonably concise review of some of those uh, analytic approaches you can just see this paper okay and uh, maybe i'll talk about one or two of the the things if time permits during my last lecture but if not then you can always sort of uh, read about this and maybe ask me questions by email if something is unclear okay right so now let me discuss this fluke version of eth so what is the fluke version of eth i'll basically try to look for eigen states of this operator hf or uh, or equivalently of this uh, fluke unitary u of t right so let's say i again do this numerically because uh, this might be very hard to do analytically as i just said right there are some approximate theoretical ways to do it they are all perturbative schemes some perturbative schemes work in some regimes others work in other regimes right as is usual for any hard problem uh, but uh, basically uh, suppose i calculate this u of t on the computer right given some protocol and then i just uh, stare at the eigen values and eigen vectors of this u of t and i ask is there some version of eigen state thermalization hypothesis here that's a perfectly legitimate question to ask so it turns out remember in our, i think in my first lecture also and maybe part of my second lecture we said that the reduced density matrix of a finite subsystem in the thermodynamic limit if if eth is uh, satisfied that reduced density matrix can be thought of from uh, uh, from energy conservation and other global conservation laws right and in fact uh, for a generic system uh, the reduced density matrix which we got earlier was e to the minus beta h why did we get that because for our quench protocol the energy was a conserved quantity if i give you the energy density for the initial state that number is a conserved quantity for a quench protocol because i'm doing unitary evolution but now now i'm not doing a quench i'm doing this particular problem 
in this particular problem you can easily convince yourself that energy conservation is no longer true right because uh, you are driving the problem right you're doing this so energy conservation is no longer true because energy conservation is no longer true you even lose that conservation law so of course if you think in that particular manner which we discussed in lecture 1 you would just say that rho sub s is proportional to trace of s bar and identity here so basically locally you would think that all local operators should mimic uh, infinite temperature their infinite temperature version okay and at infinite temperature of course your hamiltonian is not important the only thing which is important is your hilbert space right and everything becomes featureless right so yeah so good so uh, so let's see so actually here is a proof a numerical proof of that so i have taken this figure i have taken this figure from this very nice uh, review by moisner and sonbi on uh, fluke uh, physics so this is a very short review okay because it doesn't try to explain things in great detail but uh, you can sort of read this uh, thing for uh, motivational purposes because it sort of highlights some <laughs> non trivialities of the field in a very nice and a compact manner okay so 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 uh, here there are some numerical plots we don't need to uh, care about which particular spin systems they are so this plot is for some local observable where the spin system is undriven and you can see that for the system size they could go to you see that there is eph here and basically this graph is smooth and this this x this y axis is expectation value of o in the eigen state and uh, this graph is completely smooth and uh, you can fit it to a thermal line to a good approximation okay now you take the same problem and you go to the fluke version of that and then you have a u of t and you look at its eigen vectors and you look at the corresponding eigen states okay if you look at the corresponding eigen states then you see that basically you just get a featureless answer you just get a featureless answer it's just flat how would you have got this answer here very simple you take your thermal answer and you put beta equal to 0 okay then this graph would have gone to this graph basically or or basically more precisely this thermal line would have gone to this thermal line okay so in that sense uh, this is the sense in which me i mean that the local quantities uh, in this fluke problem just relax to their uh uh infinite temperature values okay so one point that i would like to just stress here is the following uh, that because uh, there is a periodicity in time uh the energy eigen values are only defined modulo 2 pi by 2 that's why they are called quasi energies this is exactly like uh, uh, momentum is only defined uh, modulo reciprocal vectors in uh, in a crystal right uh, because there is a discrete symmetry right so basically eigen vectors of u of t uh, from uh, on general grounds even from basically whatever fluke did you can just derive everything from there Uh, on general grounds an eigen vector of uh, u of t uh, is expressible like this is expressible like this and this kind of a form is again very re reminiscent to you from block theorem for example so this is just a time version of that so but this thing actually came earlier fluke's work actually came earlier so 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 this phi of t is actually periodic in time but this e alpha which i call quasi uh, quasi energy is just defined modulo 2 pi by 2 okay so so when you are plotting such a thing normally in numerics you just uh, uh, choose a particular brillouin zone and then you just plot it but uh, that's okay i mean that's the usual thing you do okay so then you should all be very sad the reason you should all be very sad is if i'm telling you that uh, if you periodically drive any system it just keeps absorbing energy and it just flows to an infinite temperature state as long as local properties are concerned that's a very boring state of matter why are we then talking of fluke states of matter right i mean all fluke states of matter should be completely uninteresting okay should be completely uninteresting because they should all flow to infinite temperature right for local properties but thankfully the answer is much richer thankfully the answer is much richer and in the remaining time today and for the next lecture i'll try to give you a glimpse of that okay 
So here is an example of a numerical calculation again. This is a phase uh, which is called uh, Kluge many body localized phase. I'll introduce all these terms to you. Okay, but here this U of T violates eigenstate thermalization hypothesis. So, uh, so the Fluke version of that. Okay, because the Fluke the ETS just tells you that everything should have been here. But here you see that there's a tremendous scatter here. So this violates uh, Fluke ETH. Okay, so then you can ask me why is Fluke ETH uh, money? So the first question you can ask me is uh, uh, why do I go from here to here? Right, because I'm still looking at local operators. Uh, what breaks down in my earlier description of ETH, right? Why do I always go here? That's an interesting question. So this tells you that there is something very peculiar about the Fluke Hamilton, this object, this object. This tells you, this graph tells you, this graph tells you that the Fluke Hamiltonian cannot be a local in space Hamiltonian. This is obvious from whatever we have learned so far. Why is that obvious? See, if it were a local in space Hamiltonian, right? Of course, I appreciate that the Fluke Hamiltonian may be different from the uh, instantaneous Hamiltonian. Of course, it would be. But suppose it's some local in space Hamiltonian, some with some non trivial spatial structure. Then, from whatever we have discussed, it's obvious that we should have maybe gotten a different graph, but some graph like this here with some feature. Right, because I'm taking a Hamiltonian at some finite temperature again, right? Uh, so yeah, and uh, more importantly, there should have been some quantity which is like the expectation value of this new operator HF, which should have been conserved, which should have emerged as a new conservation law, right? In my stroboscopic dynamics, because this is a local quantity, right? So I can just think of this as ETH of this local Hamiltonian, right? Okay, uh, where the only difference is that the time runs in integers like this. That's the only difference. Okay, but of course this is not true. So what is the assumption that can break down? The assumption, the only assumption that can break down is that Fluke Hamiltonian being a local operator in space. So that is the assumption which must break down in this story. Okay, and in fact that is indeed the assumption which breaks down. So on general grounds for a generic interacting theory. The Fluke Hamiltonian cannot, the Fluke Hamiltonian cannot be written as a short range Hamiltonian, even though H sub T is of course a short range Hamiltonian, because that is the kind of problem I have been talking about, right? <coughs> so uh, <coughs> one way to see this very straightforwardly is the following. Uh, one way to see it very straightforwardly is the following. Suppose I take a problem uh, where the periodic protocol is that for time t1, uh, sorry, for the first time interval t2, the Hamiltonian is some local Hamiltonian H2. Then for the next time interval t1, it's some local Hamiltonian H1. Then for the next time interval t2, it's again H2. Then for the next time interval uh, t1, it's again H1. So again, it's like a piecewise function, uh, which is periodic in time. Okay. So for this function, uh, this is the unitary time evolution operator, right? This just comes from quantum mechanics. Now, how do I calculate this? This is easy to calculate in one way. Of course, it gives you a series expansion. That way is just use the baker campbell hausdorff formula, right? To just calculate this. And that's what I have motivated here. So where these symbols are this, right? So the Fluke Hamiltonian is basically an infinite series like this. The, uh, the right-hand side, uh, so the left-hand side is, let's say, HF. The right-hand side is an infinite series like this. But you can easily convince yourself that this term is local, right? Because it's just a sum of two local operators, H1 and H2 is local. You can show that this term is slightly more non-local, this term. Okay, you can just show that this term is slightly more non-local because there's a commutator involved here. You can just solve it and just see it for some simple Hamiltonian. You can show that this term is slightly more non-local than this or this. Then the next term is slightly more non-local, okay? So suppose this series would have converged. Suppose this series would have converged, then you would have still got a local representation of the entire problem. But the interesting bit is that this, this, this series does not converge for any many body system. Okay, because the series does not converge, and then if you go to an arbitrary large order in the series, 
you get an arbitrary term with uh, support on some like huge number of sides and that number of sides keeps increasing and increasing and you just get a very complicated uh, uh, very complicated uh, fluke hamilton very very complicated non local fluke hamilton in fact if you exponentiate that complicated operator this u of t this u of t this u of t actually mimics a random matrix this u of t mimics a random matrix why because the eigen vectors of the u of t for all local operators just give you the infinite temperature answer so that's what i've written here the u of t resembles a random matrix uh, with all its eigen states mimicking random states as far as local quantities are concerned even though it emerges from this uh, structure like this okay so it's not entirely obvious why this structure should give you an infinite temperature ensemble but maybe this argument tells you that it does okay but then it's an interesting question to ask why this structure would necessarily give you a pseudo random object which mimics uh, something like that okay so yeah but uh, yeah so i'll i'll go on after uh, from this i'll tell you that uh, you will not always get this very boring fluke eth but uh, if you had a generic interacting theory this is all that you would get if you had a generic interacting short range model fluke eth tells you that your uh, local operators would synchronize with your driving frequency at some time if you are looking at stroboscopic observations and the steady state value would just approach infinite temperature ensemble end of story there is nothing more to it okay uh yeah uh okay but let me take a pause and ask you if there are any questions on this this is the generic answer any questions on this on anything okay uh okay so maybe this was all clear <laughs> or maybe this was all unclear okay so now uh let me switch to okay maybe in the interest of time let me go on like this okay so uh, uh, uh so now uh, here is the question that i have raised fluke system seem to always approach infinite temperature ensemble for local properties which is also in the field called the heat death scenario some papers have called it that so then the obvious question is how do you see any non trivial examples of fluke matter that's the question now i'll sort of give you first a birds eye view of this how there is a way out of this paradox because this seems like a paradoxical situation okay okay so here is the birds eye view of this suppose i start okay so see i told you that uh, what i presented in the last few slides was the fluke version of eth i already convinced you and give you a flavor in the last few lectures that there are many interacting theories which do, do not satisfy eth then it's not obvious that if you put a fluke structure there it's not at all obvious that uh, the fluke versions of those problems would satisfy fluke eths why because the original problem don't satisfy eths so why should the driven problem go to fluke eths that's one way of thinking about it right and uh, you see that's what i have tried to motivate here if the undriven problem has uh, does not satisfy eths for some reason there may be several reasons okay in fact i haven't given you all the reason so one reason may be integrability the other reason may be quantum many body scarring right uh then there is a third reason which is going to be important for us i'll introduce some concepts here soon in today's lecture because i'll need it in the next le lecture to understand time crystals uh so there is another phenomenon called many body localization okay so and there are many others i haven't exhausted this list here and of course there's an open field that's why i put dots here okay so 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 there are these mechanisms of intro of uh, having uh, of having violations of eth in a interacting theory right so maybe if i put a fluke structure there maybe if i put a fluke structure there i may escape fluke eth okay then i would maybe not go here okay in fact i already showed you that for the integrable model of transverse field ising model you do have that you go to a periodic generalized gibbs ensemble you don't go to a infinite temperature ensemble uh so i don't know whether i'll have time tomorrow to show this but if you do the same for quantum many body scars you actually get the fluke version there where very interestingly uh most of the states satisfy this kind of a thing 
but there are some enamel states in your uh, spectrum of U of P which do not satisfy fluke ETS. So I would call them fluke stars, fluke quantum stars. So that kind of a thing also happens. Uh, maybe if I don't have time tomorrow at the end, I'll just show you some pictures. Okay. And then what I'm going to concentrate on, what I'm going to concentrate on for the rest of my lecture today and tomorrow. So today I'll introduce some machinery because I need some machinery for this is time crystals. Okay. So basically if you put a fluke structure on this kind of a thing, you may, if you choose your uh, 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 parameters properly, you may get a phase of matter. Uh, which is a time crystal. This is a driven phase of matter. And there's a very interesting phase of matter because uh, this phase of matter breaks uh, time translation symmetry in a very particular way and it cannot be realized in equilibrium. Okay, so you need this driving to realize this structure. And uh, by the way, most of these things have been seen in experiments. So people have seen time crystals in these quantum simulators. Uh, people have seen versions of scars, fluke scars in these quantum simulators. People have seen periodic generalized Gibbs ensembles in quantum simulators and so on, right? Uh, so, uh, uh, so people have seen uh, uh, many things for now. Uh, I'm sorry, there's a phone call. Can you excuse me for one minute? I'll be back in one minute. Sorry. Hello? Uh, sorry. Yeah, I'm back. Uh, so, 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 so uh, this is uh, uh, part one of the story. Let me also tell you part two of the story, which is uh, very, very interesting and actually a wide open subject still. Okay, so here is part two of the story. So you see, uh, this is something I did not talk even when I was introducing ETH. I told you that those off diagonal terms, remember in our first lecture, we said that there is a, a, a statement of ETH for the diagonal elements of an operator and for the off diagonal matrix elements of an operator, right? When you look in the energy, uh, basis, right? And I didn't touch upon the off diagonal part, uh, but I said that uh, those are the things which control the approach to the uh, which control the approach to the uh, final uh, thermal answer, right? So here in fluke ETH also, uh, there is a lot of information in the off diagonal part uh, when you look at local operators. Here I'm just showing you the uh, diagonal answer. I'm not showing you the off diagonal answer. So you can perfectly legitimately ask the question, how does the system approach infinite temperature answer? How does it approach infinite temperature answer? Okay. So, uh, 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 so suppose, uh, uh, suppose the system approaches the infinite temperature answer in the following way. Suppose it uh, goes to first a pre-thermal regime when you're driving the problem in a fluke manner. Suppose it goes to pre-thermal regime spends a lot of time there and then after a long time then it approaches the infinite temperature answer right but suppose this time scale that it spends it in the pre-thermal regime is a very very long time scale then for all practical purposes i can in principle stabilize the interesting properties here i would call them pre-thermal phases just to distinguish them from the fact that the final steady state is a boring steady state but the transient behavior is highly interesting and the transient behavior is extremely long lived in some particular situations. So there are some mechanisms to do that. And again, all the mechanisms are not known here. It's a very wide open uh, research area. Okay. Uh, so for example, uh, maybe I'll uh, tell you in brief how I can stabilize these time crystals uh, in a pre-thermalization sense. So I can stabilize some of these properties uh, in an interacting theory where if I wait till truly infinite time, then I'll go to infinite temperature ensemble. But there is a long time window where I'll see exactly the properties that I see here. Here, if I have many body localization, I see those properties asymptotically in time. That's why I call them a sort of a fluke phase of matter. Here, that's why I call them a fluke pre-thermal phase of matter, just to distinguish these two things, okay? Because here it just flows to infinite temperature ultimately. But the interesting bit is, as some of you may know, because this is a sort of a well-known topic, um, in many body localization, you need strong disorder and you also need one dimension. Uh, here, uh, maybe I'll just state this without proof later on because I think I'll run out of time. Here, what is very interesting is you don't need disorder. You can even do this without disorder and you can do this at higher dimensions. Okay, you can do this at higher dimensions and you can do this without disorder. Okay. So, yeah, 
so this is sort of the birds eye view of how fluke phases can be interesting okay so before i go on maybe i will pause and ask if there is any question so on this sort of general slide this is okay this is the reason why you can stabilize non trivial phases if you drive system periodically okay so uh so i know i mean in usually case i guess the octagonal elements are supposed to be exponentially uh, small yeah uh, but here it, it, that's what one can get around is it in the floke uh, yeah no yeah, yeah in the right yeah yeah so Re here uh, here uh, so actually even in eth you can get around that uh, i did not talk of it uh, much so so i'll explain one of the p thermalization mechanisms here so just to come to your point of vision there so even in an eth system suppose i take an integrable theory right uh the integrable theory just goes to a generalized gibson ensemble right now right. you can imagine adding a small uh, coupling to that integrable model which is let's say g times some other v g uh, g times v g is the parameter right, right. where okay. v breaks integrability right now let's say g is the small number Uh, from whatever we have learned in ETH, uh, then the final theory should go to uh, some thermal steady state, right? Uh, right? Now you can ask at what time scales it goes to the thermal uh, steady state. The answer is right, actually right. the time scale goes as one by g square. Okay. Okay. So one by g square. In fact, here what is more interesting is here I can stretch that time scale exponentially long. That is more interesting, in fact. So yeah. Okay. There it's like a power law thing, right? Here, right, in okay. some sense, I can stretch the time exponentially long if I play around with some parameters. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? So even in even in part one of our lectures, there was a version of pre-thermalization, which I just didn't have the time to go into. Yeah. Okay. So if there are no questions here, then let me go on. uh so this will be a lightning review of uh, many body localization i'll just uh, highlight some important things which i'll need for my lecture tomorrow okay but uh, i would really like to point you to these very excellent uh, review papers uh by these uh, authors in particular i learned a lot about this subject from this uh, review okay this one okay so 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 uh, what is many body localization many body localization is the many body version of uh, anderson localization which is a one body like a non interacting problem anderson as i showed you in my first lecture was also worrying about uh, interacting problems in his original paper right then to do analytic calculations he switched to a non interacting problem but much more recent developments in the field have shown that uh, you can have localization even in uh, even in uh, many body systems okay you can have localization even in many body systems so what do i mean by that basically what i mean by that is unlike systems which thermalize where typically the excitations are delocalized so what do i mean by that suppose you have a system at a high energy and you create a localization somewhere okay some localized excitation somewhere i mean let's say you flip an extra spin somewhere or do something that's some localized excitation that localized excitation would typically if you give reasonable time to that thermal uh, to that uh, system that satisfies eth typically that that excitation would just spread out in your system okay typically that excitation would just spread out in your system however in a many body localized space so i'll just call it mbl for short what happens is if you create an excitation somewhere even in a high energy state maybe that excitation spreads a bit maybe that excitation spreads a bit but it only spreads by a certain amount okay suppose you create an excitation at a point on your lattice maybe it's a spin problem you flip a spin uh, then that ex excitation only spreads a certain amount and after that it doesn't spread or if it spreads the effect is exponentially suppressed okay and that's why there is a length scale and that length scale is uh, some psi correlation uh, some psi localization that i would introduce in my uh, next slide okay and that is how the length scale emerges in a many body problem see in a one body anderson uh, problem it's very simple how there is a localization there you just look at any uh, any uh, 
so uh, just take the classic anderson problem in one dimension fermions uh, living in a uh, random chemical potential right if your chemical potential were not was not there all your wave functions are plane waves but suppose you introduce a random chemical potential and in particular let's say your chemical potential is strong like this randomness is strong of course it works even if it's weak but let's say if it's strong then if you solve your wave functions again on the computer for this one body problem let's say then you would see that the wave functions are highly localized maybe one wave function is localized on some sites here or bunch of sites here the other wave function is localized at some sites here or some bunch of sites here and so on right and uh, in the strong disorder limit you can just see from the spatial uh, profile of your one body wave function that there is a concept of a localization there in a many body wave function of course you cannot think like that there is no way you can think like that because think of a spin system or a many body interacting fermion system there is a wave function everywhere right it's a many body wave function so you cannot think like that but the way to think of that is you just create an excitation on top of that excitation and that excitation spreads a bit but it just spreads a bit it cannot spread more than that on top of that excitation on on top of that original state okay so that's why this uh, concept of uh, length scale emerges in the many body problem okay right so was there a question uh, maybe i heard something or maybe not uh, actually uh, you asked oh. question, but sorry maybe there is a question a very faint sound but maybe i'm just hearing somebody uh, yeah yeah there is a question uh, i think can you hear me yes i can hear you yes yeah, yes actually i had a related question can you can you I mean... can you talk a bit louder i can just hear you very faintly sorry about that Yeah. Uh, yeah so i had a question a uh, uh, question but that was related to the zero mode so i can ask it later so since you have moved uh, yeah maybe that's better so, yeah, yeah. yeah yeah okay yeah. so it was related to the eth that's why uh, yeah, yeah. yeah maybe maybe it. we can discuss it after this talk yes. and during the question session right okay yeah. right but hopefully i have at least physically convinced you how you can define a sense of a localization length even in a many body problem and as i've shown in pictures here Uh, uh if you start with like a, a spin system or even an equivalent fermion system and here again i draw the equivalence doing jordan wigner transformation so if you start with an initial state if it's a thermalizing system if you start with a state like that if you wait long enough uh it just thermalizes right here i'm just doing usual uh, uh, quench dynamics right however in a many body localized system if you do this uh then you will see that there'll be a memory left even though it's a highly interacting thing so you can ask me why is there a memory left i'll show you in a rapid fire sense that the memory is left because now there's an emergent form of integrability and that emergent form of integrability is very interesting it's not fine tuned like integrable models in integrable models if you change your hamiltonian by a tiny amount integrability is lost in the thermodynamic limit uh for few body systems uh, you still have a version of the km theorem uh right for few body systems but if you go to a uh, system with a huge number of degrees of freedom uh i think typically if you put any small integrability breaking term it just gets immediately lost okay uh yeah but here you will see that uh, this many body localized thing is actually a phase this integrability survives for a while okay so yeah so basically uh, uh just as a toy problem there are many things written here which you can read later and you can ask me later if it's unclear maybe tomorrow or something uh, when i start my lecture so here is the model the model is again a spin problem spin half problem on a 1d line so this is like a, a xxz chain with the sx sx and sy sy interaction okay and this is the two shield term i put a strong but random magnetic field here this guy and let's say i pick out the field from a distribution minus w to w so if if i increase my w my disorder strength increases right that's the tuning parameter okay right and this is also what you do in usual spin glass problems and things like that to introduce disorder right so i do something similar here okay good and uh, you can map this problem to a jordan wigner by a jordan wigner transformation to some other problem like this as well yeah you can do that so now imagine that i keep this coupling fix this coupling fix and this coupling fix okay so then the only tuning parameter in my theory is w right that's the only tuning parameter 
And what am I looking at? I am, let's say, looking at the spectrum. Let's say I'm on my computer and I'm looking at the spectrum uh, of the energies, uh, energy states, and I'm seeing whether ETS is true or not. Okay. Then there actually is a phase transition here at some finite W star. So basically, if you crank up your disorder, there comes a threshold disorder strength beyond which the theory is always many body localized, below which the theory satisfies ETH and beyond which the theory is many body localized. Therefore, I call it a phase. It's an entire phase. Okay. And the distinction is if you see, if you see your eigenvectors here, they satisfy ETH, whereas they don't satisfy, they violate ETH here. All of your eigenvectors violate ETH here. Okay. And in fact, they violate ETH in a very peculiar way. They violate ETH. So remember, we said that uh, when we were discussing in the first three lectures that one signature of ETH is that the high energy eigenstates have a volume loss scaling of entanglement. Here, in many body localized systems, not only the ground states, but almost all excitations, almost all excitations have ALO uh, scaling. Not only the ground states, even the high energy ones, even the middle mid spectrum ones have uh, high energy uh, 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 ground states. Okay, uh, sorry, have high energy, uh, have a, have a low entanglement, have area law entanglement. Okay, so this is a remarkable statement, and this immediately tells you that uh, ETH is strongly violated here, whereas ETH is not violated here. So if you look at eigen spectrum, there is a genuine phase transition here. There is a genuine phase transition here in the thermodynamic limit from this phase to this phase. Okay. So I said almost all eigenstates. If I had time, I would have elaborated on this point. There are a few eigenstates here, even in this problem, which have volume law. But uh, then you can ask me, why don't those states destroy this thing? But that's much more subtle. There's actually a proof in one dimension by Imbri in 2014. Okay. And uh, that's a very complicated uh, mathematical physics proof which tells you that in 1D, these uh, guys don't spoil the story, but in 2D, the effect is more subtle. Okay, but let's not go there. Okay, so, so this picture that I just now told you that if you have an excitation in the MBL phase and you, you create an, so if you have a high energy state in the MBL phase and you create an excitation on top of that, right, by hitting it with some operator, then, that, then you just let the system time evolve. Then that excitation only spreads by a finite amount. Uh, actually, more rigorously, it spreads by an amount like e to the minus r by xi localization. Okay, so so this xi localization is that localization concept. Using similar arguments, you can prove why there is an area law here for these other states. Okay, so I have sort of written the argument here. So basically, the intuition is in the MBL phase, a local perturbation in space in space only significantly affects degrees of freedom within a localization length. That's the intuition. Okay. So yeah, I'm sorry I haven't uh, given you any more rigorous statement here. Firstly, it's hard to define it more rigorously. And secondly, I think it's more important at the initial stage to just have this intuitive picture in mind. Okay. So yeah. Uh, right. So now, uh, 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 so now something very remarkable happens. So you see, most of the states here are area law, right? Almost all states are area law. So let me ignore this fact. I let me just abuse language and I say that all states are area law. Actually, these states are a measure zero thing. Let me just therefore say that all states are area law in the MDL phase. Now, see, there's a very interesting thing here. Uh, uh, so suppose uh, you go to this problem and you go to the limit of j perpendicular being zero in this problem, x, x, z again. Okay. Then, of course, this problem is a classical problem. You can diagonalize it in the SZ basis, the usual product state basis. In the product state basis, all the states have zero entanglement by definition. Okay. Now, suppose you turn on a small edge perpendicular. By the thing which I rapidly went over here, you can convince yourself or you can see the papers. Uh, the many body phase is stabilized if uh, J perpendicular is non zero. But if J perpendicular is small but non zero, of course, the problem cannot be straightforwardly diagonalized in this uh, SZ basis. But what do you do on your computer? On your computer, at least if you think in principle, you can always write a unitary transformation. You can always write a unitary transformation 
uh, which takes you from the product basis to some other new basis in which your uh, full many body problem is uh, uh, diagnosed right so in a usual problem in a usual problem uh, uh, you have you go to states which are uh, thermal or volume loss states in a usual problem right because as soon as you turn your coupling in usual scenarios it just becomes thermal okay but here because of strong disorder the problem does not become thermal it's actually a many body localized thing where the states are also area law they, are, they don't have zero entanglement they have some entanglement but that entanglement is area law then you can actually convince yourself this is a bit hard to do you can convince yourself that the unitary evolution that you do to diagonalize your hamiltonian is something which is called as a quasi local uh, unitary evolution and uh, uh, what happens is sorry i'm really running over this but i encourage you to read those two reviews in particular the second review to gain some more insight in this okay uh, what actually happens is uh, uh, that unitary transformation in some sense in some very precise sense in some very precise sense is localized in space okay is localized in space and uh, for the mbl problem and therefore you can actually think of a dressed version you can actually think of a dressed version of this uh, operator sigma iz see in this limit in this limit uh, when jz uh, j perpendicular is zero sigma iz is obviously commuting with your hamiltonian what i'm saying is even when j perpendicular is non zero but small there is a dressed version of these operators Uh, and it's dressed in uh, sort of real space okay that's because these operators are in some sense local these unitary operators and uh, uh, these uh, dressed operators just have a finite support around these particular size that's why i call this i as well as this i and importantly uh, there are an extensive number of these dressed operators and therefore this problem has an emergent integrability again now this is an emergent integrability because it's very hard to calculate this u on general grounds and there is a special spatial structure in u which leads to this uh, thing okay and this this emergent integrability is robust to small changes in coupling okay so uh, so i'll just take a few more minutes i know i'm running out of time i just want to finish a couple, uh, one or two more slides uh, so 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 uh, so the physical intuition is that this u this transformation that you let's say are doing in your exact diagonalization to diagonalize your matrix the physical intuition is that this u is quasi local uh, quasi local because again there are some exponential pairs that's why i call it quasi local this u is quasi local because it sort of rotates rotates your product basis which has zero entanglement to area law eigen states of mbl so the entanglement change is not that drastic whereas generically in an interacting problem if you didn't have disorder for example in this problem then generically for that problem uh you go from this product basis to a to a eigen state basis but the eigen state basis have volume law entanglement then just from that you can show that this u must be highly 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 non local in space right because you see by this u i can always construct and so u i can always construct even for a general thermal problem then you can ask me why is a general thermal problem not thermal uh, sorry not integrable the reason is this transformation is so non local this uh, operator does not have any support on the original operator right that's it so there is no use thinking in terms of this operator it's a it's an extremely complicated description of the problem which is literally the same as saying that you solve the problem that's it there's no simplification okay so yeah so sorry uh, so i have uh, sort of stated some things here and uh, uh, maybe i'll present the next few slides in tomorrow's lecture uh, uh but uh, the remarkable thing is that because uh, the mbl state uh, has area law entangled states you remember one of the things i said in lecture 1 is that area law states are ground stateable right in the sense that there exists a local hamiltonian which may be for which that high energy state may be a ground state if it has area law right of course you cannot generically do it because generic high energy states have volume law but in this example all the high energy states have area law so they are in some sense ground stateable so just from that there is a possibility of stabilizing long range order and even topological order in many body localized systems even at high energies okay so i hope 
sort of the chain of arguments is clear, even though I haven't given you any detail. And uh, maybe now I'll uh, stop this uh, lecture for now and uh, wait for your questions. And uh, yeah, sorry for going a bit over time. Yeah. So, okay, uh, any questions? At least there was one question from Show Me, and uh, yes. uh, hello, I cannot hear you again. Can you talk a bit sorry. louder, Show Me? Uh, yes, uh, can you? No, hear a me? bit more louder. Sorry, sorry, I cannot hear you. Uh, hello, yeah, can yeah, you hear me? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so about the zero modes, which yes. are this, uh, there is no rebel repulsion. Yes. Uh, on the other hand, they have they satisfy ETH. So, yes. uh, does the off diagonal elements also goes to zero with in the thermodynamic limit? And what about the uh, diagonal element of the local operator? Also, uh, the scaling of this with the system size. Okay. So, I don't think this has been studied very much. So, I cannot give you a very precise answer, but. Uh, there is already a small point here which I would like to use. So suppose you are trying to test for diagonal ETH here. Okay, suppose you are trying to test for diagonal ETH. See, this is a degenerate manifold, right? So it's not obvious uh, how you test for ETH here uh, because any linear combination of these modes is also a zero mode, right? So there's a tremendous freedom here. So typically, the way you should think of testing uh, for ETH here is. You take whatever local operator you're doing, uh, take, uh, considering, okay, and then you have this massive uh, space here, right? You have this massive space here. You go to the particular uh, basis, uh, which uh, also sort of uh, diagonalizes O, okay? That you can always do because you have so many states here, okay? And in that basis, you will see that those O's are all basically clustered around and clustered to the thermal line, okay? So that's the answer for the diagonal part of the ETH. Okay, at least from some numerical study. Uh, this hasn't been studied too much because this is a very recent development. Uh, I'm not completely sure about the off-diagonal thing, but I can say one thing looking at all the numerical literature, it suggests that uh, ETH is true both for the zero modes as well as for the non-zero modes. But the uh, but uh, if you look at the scaling with system size. It seems that the uh, zero modes go to ETH a bit slower than non-zero mode. But it's not that the difference is an exponential versus a power law. It's not that kind of a thing. It's a different, it's a difference between some three factors in some sense. Okay. So that's as far as I know. Okay, thank you. Any other questions maybe on the flu case stuff or yeah, or on MBL, even though it was Lightning quick, the review. Hello, somebody is talking, but I think I cannot hear that person. Uh, uh, yeah, probably I, I don't see any other questions. Okay. So one quick question on, I mean, uh, for the MBL state, if you plot uh, expectation value of some local operator yeah. against energy. So you'll get some uh, rough. Uh, you get here, something right? like this. You'll get something like this. Oh, that's the thing. Okay. No, this is not MBL. This is fluke MBL. But okay. MBL also you'll get. Yeah, yeah. So for example, Abhishek, the here I made a statement. Of course, I went rapidly through this. You see, uh, for some regimes, I said that there is even like a spin glass order, which you can stabilize at high energy, right? So that obviously means that local operators even though they have non-zero expectation values fluctuate strongly between one eigenvector and the neighboring one, right? Because right, okay, I mean, yeah. this is also something which happens in uh, spin glasses, right? right of course, yeah. I'm not saying that this is spin glass. I'm just trying to draw an analogy. Oh, okay. 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 So, yeah. And uh, so is it known what happens to the off-diagonals here? Uh, the off-diagonals, of course, also don't satisfy ETH. But for a more precise answer, uh, I would need to look up and tell you. Of okay. course, oh, okay. So I can give you one thing very quickly. Sorry. So I can already tell you one thing. So suppose you take any eigenstate, uh, high energy eigenstate. Okay. Suppose you take any high energy eigenstate in an MBL. Okay. Then you hit it with a local operator. Okay. And then you ask 
that uh, uh, suppose on the right hand side i want to put some ej right so on the left hand side i have an ei then i hit it with a local operator and i ask what are the uh, operators uh, on the right hand side with ej right, right. so yeah. you can actually show that there are only a finite number of ejs with the think and go to uh, in the mbl phase which already tells you that there is something very peculiar because normally if you take a high energy state and you hit a local operator it goes to many other high energy states right but right, here right, it goes yeah. to, to only a very small thing because remember this oh, okay. physical picture of locality which i talked of right yeah, right? yeah, yeah. so you see you have a high energy state you take some local operator right you can think of it as a probe and you hit it on your system right which is in some particular eigen state the effect of that only propagates a bit right therefore it has superposition only on some small number of states right okay, so which means it's not going to be exponentially small no no, no. exactly exactly okay. just from this argument exactly ah, okay. okay okay but for a more precise answer i need to think of it but i think already i give you some sense of what right yeah yeah yeah, yeah. So, yeah. okay i'll take a reference later from you I mean, sure, sure 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 yeah. okay so maybe uh, we stop here uh, okay yeah, so maybe yeah so so tomorrow i'll start with time crystals then okay so okay great yeah so, so thanks everybody see you tomorrow